let's bow our heads and uh, let's get to it. So Lord Jesus, we thank you so much um, for all of your words in scripture. Uh, We thank you that even today as we're looking at what is a mere hello, uh, the hellos of your word are your word. They are inspired words carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says in 2 Peter that no man wrote on his own interpretation, but men wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the words we read today uh, are not mere literature. They're not mere history. They're not even mere salutations. They are the same word that just as we concluded a series in Deuteronomy, that burned on Mount Horeb as fire that has been given to us today to lead us to faith and repentance and a right understanding of God and of others through Jesus Christ. So we pray that we respond well, that you give us ears to hear and hearts to worship. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So we do have a privilege today. We concluded Deuteronomy last week, which is why Devin was so shocked to go from scripture readings of 12 chapters uh, in a single sermon to a mere two verses, which is what we're looking at today. And 1 Peter uh, is called First Peter because it's the first of two letters that Peter wrote to some churches in the New Testament time. And we know that it's written by Peter because Peter himself says so. At the very beginning of his letter, he says, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so Peter is the same apostle. If you read through the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is the one who's called Simon Peter. And he is in those stories, kind of simultaneously hero and gesture, depending upon what passage of scripture you're in at that time. And I love this book because there's something so timely about 1 Peter, not only as we gather as 21st century Americans, but we sit as those who are in an election season. We sit as those who are under kind of global fears right now. And we sit as those just locally who are staring at a building fund. And all of these things are really similar to the weights and challenges that his original readers were under. But before we get into their context more, I I want to help us understand the spiritual context of Peter himself. Peter in the Gospels was uh, often short-sighted and foolish, but he was so zealous to follow Jesus. In fact, one of those combinations of zeal and short-sightedness came where after Jesus predicted that he was going to die uh, and rise again, Peter took the liberty to rebuke Jesus himself. And that didn't get him very far in life. And this is kind of the battle we see with Peter. And and another time it comes up where uh, Peter apparently hadn't learned his lesson. And Jesus is saying, tonight, tonight the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. So on the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus says, I'm going to be arrested And you, my disciples, you're going to scatter. It's going to be hard for you to follow this Messiah who in a moment is going to turn prisoner. But Peter, he says in all of his zealous life, he says, Lord, I will never fall away. Even if I must die, I will not fall away. And Jesus says to him, Peter, I tell you tonight, you will deny me three times. And John's account of the gospel really keys in on Peter's story for the remainder of it. And what happens is later that night, Jesus is inside of a Roman garrison and Peter is gathered outside um, with a number of other people. And what's interesting is John includes uh, this wonderfully rogue and explicit comment that they were standing around a charcoal fire. It was cold and so the guards and those who had gathered to see what was going on had gathered around this fire and it was around this fire as Peter was warming himself, kind of, uh, you know, probably looked a little bit like a Jedi, drawn back, not wanting to be seen, that someone says, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? And Peter says, I don't even know him. And then it's around that very same charcoal fire that two more times Peter distances himself from the Savior whom hours before he pledged himself to follow even unto death. And after this, the story goes on. Jesus is crucified. But then miraculously, three days later, because Jesus was not just a man, he was fully man and fully God. Paul tells us, by the glory of God the Father, he was raised from the dead. And he appeared to numbers of people, upwards of thousands of people. But John keys in, in conclusion, on one appearance where he appeared to some of the disciples, of whom was also Peter. And look at this scene in John chapter 21, 
verses 4 through 9. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So the disciples were out in a boat, and Jesus appears on the shore. Jesus says to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea, nothing like throwing on a big denim jacket before you jump into the water. And so Peter jumps into the sea, and the other disciples came in the boat like normal people, dragging the nets full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And so here you have Peter, who's so excited to see Jesus... He completely disregards the massive, miraculous catch. He puts on clothes to jump into the water and swims 100 yards. Meanwhile, while his friends are like rowing beside him, like, what are you doing, Peter? And, and Peter gets there and he sees Jesus and he's so excited. And what is he immediately confronted by? The scent of a charcoal fire. Do you guys have smells that elicit specific memories? for you. Remember the last time in John's gospel that the last time Peter smelled a smell as distinct as this, he was betraying his Savior. The last time his clothes, now sopping wet, smelled like charcoal, was a moment riddled with failure. And here in all of his excitement, Peter gets to Jesus and is confronted by the same Jesus that he recently denied. But look at what happens in verses 15 through 19. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So Jesus puts in more of these because he's totally convincing Peter to take the bait, right? Peter says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This was to show by what kind of death he was going to die to glorify God. And so just predicting Peter's martyrdom. And after saying this, Jesus said to him, follow me. And so here we have zealous Peter, who failed Jesus three times, but when confronted with the resurrected Jesus, Jesus himself reaffirms Peter three times in service to the church. Three affirmations to go forward and feed his sheep. Three affirmations to go forward and minister the gospel. And Peter is writing this letter, the letter of 1 Peter, in Rome near the end of his life, reflecting on his lifetime of ministry. And this is what he writes, and he writes it as an extension of the divine command which the chief shepherd gave him, feed my sheep. This book comes from the heart of a pastor who wants you to be fed. For those who have wrestled with failure, Peter wants to feed you strength. To those who have felt alone, even in the midst of a crowd, Peter wants to bring you comfort. To those whose circumstances and sins in life feel that like at best you've been crippled or at worst you've been damned, Peter wants to introduce you to the grace that is inside of Jesus Christ. You see, Peter has this wonderful tension in his life where he felt out of place, both at the fire with the strangers the night of the crucifixion, 
and out of place in the questioning of the resurrected Savior after the crucifixion. And the only thing that made sense of his circumstances was the Jesus who continued to call Peter to himself and give him grace. And it's partly because of Peter's experience of grace and his battle with belonging in the world that Peter opened his letter to the churches like this. This is the first two verses of 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So depending upon your translation, the the word used in verse 1 is sometimes translated here in the ESV as exile. Maybe it's stranger, foreigner, alien. Maybe you have another Bible translation, but whatever the word it is, it's used to stress the out-of-placeness of the person receiving the letter. Peter addresses his letter to people whom, whether they know it or not, are exiles. And even more specifically, elect exiles. That's to say, chosen strangers, chosen by God himself. And in his introduction to his letter, what he's really setting forth is the outline for what's going to follow in the rest of the book. Peter wants to help the churches do two things, and these are going to be the two things we're going to look at today in the sermon. He wants them first to understand their nature as exiles. And then secondly, he wants to help them understand the nature of their exile. So he wants to help them understand who they are as exiles, but then he wants to help them understand what to expect in their exile. What is the nature of the exile? So helping them understand who they are, and then helping them understand how in the world they make sense of what they're going through right now. And maybe that's you today, needing to understand who you are in the gospel and how that shapes the way we live in a world which is seemingly becoming increasingly uncomfortable. And this is our first point today, understanding our nature as exiles. Peter is writing to Christians who, just like you, feel like something is wrong. Have you ever been in a season in your life where you're not quite sure what or why but something seems a bit different. Something seems a bit off and you can't quite put your finger on it. This is very much the context of these churches to whom Peter is writing. He's writing to believers just like you, believers who are gathering as churches in five specific areas of what is now Turkey, who believe in the message of Jesus Christ, but who are feeling a little uneasy. And what Peter is doing As we read through this book, we'll realize that Peter senses a a sort of confusion in these churches. They don't fully understand what's going on in their life. And in this opening greeting, Peter is giving them language and an illustration which actually helps them make sense of who they are and what they're going through. And as we just read, that illustration is that of exiles, that of strangers, that of aliens. Now what's interesting is during this time, there's no organized persecution of Christians. That's going to come in a little bit under Nero, and we'll talk about that in a moment. No one is being forced out of their jobs or out of their homes because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so in a very literal sense, these people are not exiles. They are not refugees like we know today who are being displaced from their country and hobbled into boats and being sent elsewhere. These are people who live in either their homeland or the culture that they have chosen. And yet, in that chosen or natural culture, they're beginning to face small but real pockets of difference. They're beginning to experience a sort of irritation between who they are and who the world says they are. They're beginning to become increasingly uncomfortable among those who they live with. Why is that? Why is it that in one sense nothing has changed, but in another sense these people are realizing that everything has changed? What is the nature of their exile? And this is Peter's answer. The nature of your exile is that you are chosen by God. 
when Peter is writing to Christians and he's getting them to understand their nature, first and foremost, he says, if you are a Christian, you are an elect exile. You are one chosen by God himself. You see, the gospel is the good news that Jesus did everything required to save sinners and restore us to God. And because we in our sin are dead, salvation is something that God initiates, that God comes and God chooses. Dead people don't grab ropes because they're dead. And so God in his grace comes. In that moment when we respond to God in faith, your life is secretly, subtly, and overwhelmingly turned into a life of exile. A life of exile in a world that was at one time comfortable for you. Conversion, that is to become a Christian by faith through grace in Jesus Christ, sends you back into a world which is the exact same and yet you are completely different in that world. Here's an example. Dave and Caroline were up here leading worship today. This is their last Sunday leading worship before they head home to Pennsylvania after a season of time here. In a very real sense, they're going back to their hometown. They're going back to their family. They're going back to where they grew up. They're going back to a world which they know very well. And yet, it won't be long after they arrive in this world of similarities where everything will soon be different because they're about to have a child. They'll be in a place which they know, which they are comfortable in, which they know the ins and outs of, and yet their life is going to be radically different. Things that were once enjoyable for them are now going to seem dangerous to them. My reflection on being a parent is that everything wants to kill my children. Things are different. And things that once seemed horribly boring are now wonderfully exciting. And they're having to adjust to this new normal. Everything out here is the same, but they are different because they are parents. This is what conversion does to Christians. It creates in us a sense of out-of-placeness, even if our place doesn't change. It makes us aware that something is different. Now, we often miss this. In five years, roughly, from Peter writing this letter, the emperor Nero will institute official state-sponsored persecution of Christians. And it will be bloody and it will be terrible. And he will use Christians as human torches to light his garden. And in that time, they'll understand the insider-outsider nature. And if persecution like this were to come to America, we too would understand that there is a level of insider and outsider when it comes to being a Christian. To belong to God is not to belong to those who are against God. In fact, history shows that oftentimes it's persecution that is intense, which actually strengthens and solidifies the church. It's what some of the church fathers have often said that by the blood of the martyr or the, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that real oppressive persecution that so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ face today shows us the weight of belonging to God and not belonging to the world. But what I love about 1 Peter is that he is writing to Christians and churches who are not experiencing massive and clearly oppressive persecution. He's writing to Christians who are experiencing the ordinary dissonance and tension that comes when you are loved and chosen by God, but at one point you loved and chose the world. He's highlighting the ordinary thing that shows up in our life. That when we belong to God, there should be a sense of difference because we are chosen by God. We are owned by someone who is different. We no longer belong to the world that we used to belong to. He writes to people who feel this increasing awkwardness and he is saying it's because you belong to God now. You don't belong to the world. And for Peter, this is a reminder of what he wants his friends to be greeted with. He's writing to those who feel an aching loneliness in life. He's writing to those who feel something that you might feel, to friends who are being treated differently by their former circles because now they're saved. And they don't participate in the things they used to participate in. And it brings questions and glances and judgment. Or he's writing to the person whose coworker now treats him a little awkwardly because he shared the gospel with him for the first time and now there's this sense of like, what, what do we, where do we go from here? And maybe they don't want to be left in a room alone with you because they think that you're going to talk about like the blood of Jesus or something like that and it makes them uncomfortable. 
These are things that increasingly show that we are following something that is not normal in the world. And this is what he opens up his book with to remind them that you are elect. You are loved by God. You are saved by Jesus. And to be saved by Jesus is to be put in an awkward place in culture. There is both a physical and a relational exile that happens. In Romans 8, Paul talks about this physical thing. He says that creation itself is groaning with the pains of redemption. This world longs to be saved from the things that that, that burden it. Hurricanes and tsunamis and coronaviruses and plagues. All of that remind us that this is not a world that was made to satisfy us. This world itself, sin is so pervasive, this world needs to be changed. But what's implicit to Peter's message is actually the relational aspect. Outside of diseases and natural disasters that remind us that this world is not our home, we are actually going to face culture that causes us discomfort, that makes us a little awkward, that stresses relationships a little more than they previously had been, and that can perhaps confuse us. But what's interesting is the way in which Peter opens this letter is he's actually saying that when you experience that tension, take heart. Don't be disheartened with it. Be encouraged by it because what's more to be feared than a lack of belonging in this world is a Christian who feels completely at home in this world. That is a far more dangerous experience for one who follows Jesus to have. To look around and say, everything is perfect. Look at what James says in James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you fail to understand what James and what Peter are saying, you're always going to be frustrated in life when those moments of conflict come, when those moments of tension come. And if you're not careful, what will inevitably happen is when something begins to push up, when something begins to make you feel like an exile, you will choose the path of least resistance. You will conform to the thing which is most easily conformed to. And this is why I love Peter writing this letter. Because Peter knows what this is like, doesn't he? When he stood around that fire, and when three times people asked him, weren't you a follower of Jesus? Peter knew, probably more than we would ever know. No one stood outside of a garrison being identified with a man about to be killed like Peter did. We, he knows this pressure. And he actually gave into it. He chose to try out friendship with the world. And what it showed was not a joyful future, but immense devastation for Peter. Other gospels record how burdened he was because the world couldn't give him what he wanted. The world and all of its acceptance of this man who apparently doesn't identify with Jesus, but identified with them, couldn't fix what his heart ached with. And now this Peter and his experience of conformity to culture writes to you to prepare you for that same tension. To prepare you for those times in life where when sin was once natural, you realize how unnatural it is to say no to those sins. How do you live when fighting sin isn't as easy as you think? when you feel, maybe even in terms of your body, exiled in terms of your lusts or your passion? What does that pressure look like when it is external? Maybe a terse comment from your neighbor when you invite them to church or something even weightier in this world. There are scholars who will never be top of their field, not because they're not qualified or competent, but because their field will not allow a believer to reach that level of notoriety. 
There are politicians who will be stonewalled because of their faith in Christ. In fact, less than a year ago, they tried to put in place a religious test for people running for public office. There are Hindus and Muslims who, upon conversion, are isolated, disowned, and shunned from their own family. There are churches in Africa who meet under the threat of death. In a very real sense, to be chosen by God, to be an elect exile, is to simultaneously be rejected by the world. And Peter wants you, us, to understand this. As I read the very first time I opened this up to look through what would it look like to do a sermon in, I was struck by the phrase elect exiles. There is no greater name for Christians than that. That's who we are. We are exiles chosen by God by grace through Jesus Christ. And Peter's question to you and to his original readers is do you believe that? Do you really believe that to be chosen by God is to find yourself at enmity with the world? Because that shapes our expectations. I remember uh, we had some refugee uh, family friends over to our house from Eritrea. And I was uh, talking to a brother in Christ. His name's Dispele. And we were kind of making small talk. We were hanging out in the backyard. And at this point, we had, Sarah and I had two daughters. Um, and he had four daughters. And so I was just like, hey, Dispele, you're a dad of girls. You, they're older than my girls. You have more of them. And so I said, what advice do you have me, for me as a father of daughters? Like, what helpful tips do you have that it takes to raise these girls? And he looks at me without any sort of condescension. And he says, Tyler, you have food and a house for your daughters. They're going to be great. You're going to do wonderfully. In Eritrea, we had none of those things. You're so blessed to be where you are. I have never felt like more of a stranger in my backyard <laughs> than I did in that moment. Because what I was thinking is the trials of like glitter and Princess Sophia and teenage hormones and all these things. And what he's thinking of are issues of life and death. And he came to comfort me. He says, you have exactly what it takes to care for your daughters. See, oftentimes in the Christian life, we get so distracted from the matters of life and death that are at stake in our salvation that our whole perception of ourselves and our reality get completely out of line. We begin to think that what is normal in the Christian life is something that is so tertiary to the Christian life. But here Peter corrects our vision. He says to be loved by God is to be an elect exile, which means at times you will feel like nothing more than a stranger, than a foreigner, or than an alien. But then he, like my wonderful brother in Christ, Dispele says, but you have everything you need. You're going to do wonderfully because you have the gospel. And this is where Peter helps. He helps us understand if you are a Christian, you are chosen by God and therefore not chosen by the world. And that changes things. But now he begins to transition to the second part of his welcome where he wants them to understand the nature of their exile. We know who we are, but help us understand what it is that we're now going through. Let's read once more verses 1 through 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And so this is where he picks up to those who are exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now let's soberly face the music here. If you're in here today and you're not a believer and you're looking at Peter's message and you're hearing what I'm saying to you, I've done a very poor job in convincing you to follow Jesus. Who would want to go from a world which welcomes us with open arms to being an exile in the exact same world? Who would want to face the weight of being a stranger, the uncomfortability of 
of being an alien in a hostile land. Well, my hope is, is that you'll stay with us as we continue to progress through this book. And you'll find so many reasons why following Jesus is worth whatever the cost. But here in this text, there are actually two ways in which Peter gives away a practical hope a hope that Christians cling to, that they desire, that they see as better than anything the world can offer. And the first is this, is that in understanding the nature of our exile, we understand that in our exile, we are never alone. You see, Christian or not, you're going to encounter seasons of sorrow. You're going to encounter seasons where the, even the body you're familiar with becomes broken or begins to break down, and you feel like an exile in your own body, in your own mind, in your own city, or in your own relationships. And as much as we love thinking that the world will be forever loyal to us, our world is far more utilitarian than we ever hope or dream. Uh, The philosopher Albert Camus said this of his own relationships. He said, I used to advertise my loyalty, and I don't believe there's a single person I loved that I didn't eventually betray. We like to think that this world will always be with us in our times of exile. But history shows us that as soon as you stop providing utility, there's nothing to be considered anymore. But this is why I love 1 Peter. The wonderful news of Peter's message is to those who feel confused, to those who feel like outsiders, to those who feel like aliens, you're not alone. He is writing to the elect exiles, churches in five different places to get acquainted with pastoral epistles like this. When we read the word you, we need to take a line out of our southern brother's page and we need to hear it as y'all. He's talking to, to us all. He's like, you are all elect exiles. You are not alone in this matter. Across this area, there are churches of believers just like you who are going through these exact same things. And this doesn't mean that in the church there will never be breaches of loyalty. It doesn't mean there's never going to be betrayal or sin amongst people. We are broken people being redeemed by grace, and that will naturally happen. But what it does mean is that what binds this community of exiles together is not utility. It's not hobbies or interests or something to be given that can quickly be lost. What's at the center of the community of the church is a salvation given to them by God. The elect nature of their exile. You see, the church is not a special interest group for those who have nothing better to do on Sundays. The church is not a recent and Western oddity, even though that might be what people try to convince you of. The church is the result of God's saving work to gather people together as a community of refugees as God has commanded himself to do. And when the church gathers, I remember uh, after we had Despelli and his family over, they had us over to their house. And in walking into their house, we were in Missoula, very much so, his apartment's right over here. But in walking in, Samrawit, who's his wife, was, don't tell building code people this, she was like over an open fire roasting coffee for us (laughs) in, uh, in, in in an Eritrean dish. And they had pictures of their homeland. And they had a picture of Jesus from their Eastern Orthodox Church. And going into their home, I realized that though this was in my world, it looked a lot like their homeland. And when we gather as the church, we are adorning our city with a small apartment where when people come in, they say, this is what the homeland's like. This is what God's community is meant to look like. This is a community that understands the commands to love the Lord and love others. And not only do others see it, But when people come in here, fellow believers in Christ, whether they move from Eritrea or they move here from Alberton, they see that this is where they need to be. That this is a community that reminds them of the things that are far more than superficial. The church is a necessary and essential encouragement in our time of exile. And it will not do you well to neglect this. The Bible has no category for Lone Ranger Christianity. The author of Hebrews uses this idea of this illustration of spiritually homeless people all the time. And this is what leads him to say this in Hebrews 
10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the day, or encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We want the church to be a place for those who are hurting to come and be comforted by by those who have hurt. To those who are grieving who can come and receive comfort from those who have grieved. To those who are in need of encouragement to come and receive encouragement from those who have been encouraged by those who just like you are elect exiles in this world but loved by God. You're not alone. God has given us the church in all of our trials, in all of their weight, and in all of our weaknesses. But even more than that, God has given us himself. In fact, Peter says that we are elect exiles. We are in these seasons of sojourning because God the Father has foreknown it and predetermined it. But that's not the end. Not only has God the Father ordained the days of your life, but he's done so in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ, the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son are fully involved in our time of exile. There are times where even amongst our brothers and sisters of Christ, even in the church, that our own feelings of isolation and sorrow will crush us and isolate us and speak lies to us. And we live in a world where the drop of a tweet or the click of a post will tell you that you don't matter. That all you are is an outsider. But it's in those moments when your experience and your externals tell you you don't matter that Peter here says that you matter deeply to the triune God of Scripture. The entire work of the Godhead is with you in this season of sojourning. You see, our world knows exile. And it knows how to weaponize it. And it exiles people all the time for the perceived wrongness those people have committed. You're exiled because you have wrong beliefs, wrong politics, wrong hair color, wrong gender, wrong nationality. But God here brings people into exile precisely because he loves them and he wants them to experience a nearness with him which is not possible if the world is held dear. Our God, one God in three persons, has orchestrated in history so that he might be near to us in our salvation. I want you to think about where you are right now in your walk with God, in your thoughts on God, in the circumstances of your life. And I want you to realize that it is not an arbitrary byproduct of history. It is not a roll of the dice. It is according to the wonderful plan of the triune God to draw you increasingly near to him through Jesus Christ. Christ. In our sojourning, we are reminded of God's pervasive nearness to us when it seems that nothing else is near. John Bunyan was a preacher in England who was imprisoned for most of his life for preaching the gospel without a permit. That was a thing at one point. And it was uh, in prison, in his own exile, where he said this, I never had in all my life so great an inlet into the word of God as now. Those scriptures I saw nothing in before are made in this place and state to shine upon me. Jesus Christ also was never more real and apparent than now. Here I have seen him and felt him indeed. Because salvation, because being chosen by God in Jesus Christ is a sign of our salvation, we have the promise that whatever it is we are going through, because God has moved towards us before we ever move towards God, that God is with us in all things. To use Bunyan's language, God is shining on you, even if it seems to channel David that you are walking in the valley of the shadow of death. God is not unconcerned with you. And this is the next thing. Peter wants them to understand about the nature of their exile is that our exile 
is never for nothing. All of the aches and pains, all of the feelings of loneliness, it's never for nothing. Look at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Because God called us to salvation in Jesus Christ, because God has planned and prepared the days of our lives for us, we know that even when we feel more strange, more alone, more foreign, we are not experiencing those things for nothing. There is no wasted season of your life if you are an elect exile. God is doing something. And this is going to be a huge theme in the book of 1 Peter is what is accomplished in our sojourning. We're going to start with this next week, and it's going to advance itself more as the book goes on. God is doing something for our good. And this is something for us to remember in our own context with our need to raise funds for a building. And this has been something which, for me and for some of the elders, it's just been a burden for us. And as we look at what it takes to change a warehouse into a church, there are numbers that keep going up and hurdles that keep presenting themselves. And in that, I become anxious, and I begin to think, what if the city didn't buy our land? What if we were able to renew our lease? What if some outside angel donor came and wrote one big check to process all of this? What if I could avoid all the weight of this progress? What if I could just get done with this season? What if I could be done with this? My hope, in my weakness, is that one day this season will be over. But here Peter has a better hope. And that hope is that God is actually accomplishing something in this season. No prayer, no active service, no counting of our budget is wasted when we serve a sovereign God. He right now wants to accomplish something in this church, in your life, for his glory. And nothing, not even our worst dreams, can slow that down. What is it that God wants to accomplish? Well, Peter tells us two things. In our trials, we are set apart by the Holy Spirit. We're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We are progressively made more holy by the Holy Spirit. And why are we set apart? For what reason are we made holy? And where does holiness show up? in obedience to Jesus Christ. The dark seasons of our life exist to remind us of the hope we have in the Holy Spirit and to cause us to obey Jesus more visibly. This is the exact point Paul himself makes in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that is Jesus, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The hope of good in any circumstance for God's redeemed is that he is changing us to be more Christ-like. The lie that Christians must learn to reject in our sojourning is that it is similarity with the world that is our greatest comfort. And don't we so often long for that? We, none of us would say it, right? No one leaves here saying, if I could just look like the world, I'd be good. But how many times do we want a house like the world, a sex life like the world, a reputation like the world, a bank account like the world? But both Peter and Paul make it clear that it is Christ-likeness It is obedience to Jesus, which is the greatest comfort in the world. And this seems so counterintuitive for those who feel like sojourners. God, in his infinite wisdom, when he made us, he made us intelligent. When we touch hot things, our reaction is not to just, you know, let it hang out there for a little bit. We remove our hands. We want to minimize pain. That's a a reflex that God himself gave us. We want to stop doing things when those things become painful. So we need to rewire our anatomy of Christianity is so many times following Jesus leads us into painful circumstances. 
If it is a painful circumstance with your coworker in evangelism that led to this tension, we want to seek to no longer do it. If it was a painful act of obedience to confess this sin to a brother in the church, we want to unconfess it and never do it again. If it was a painful act of converting to Jesus when you have a family who would disown you at such that, we want to seek to minimize the change. It seems natural to us. But here Peter is saying that these seasons come so that you might obey more visibly. And the only reason this isn't just torture is because it's obedience for Jesus. But it's also for the result of the sprinkled blood of Jesus is what he says, right? For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. It's kind of an odd metaphor. It might be foreign to us. In fact, it was perhaps foreign to some of the Gentiles who are reading this in the churches. And Paul is calling back on his Jewish background here. And the sprinkling of blood was not only something that set apart priests in the Old Testament, which is something Peter's going to come back to in chapter 2, but the sprinkling of blood was also the act of covenant cleansing in the Old Testament. To have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus which is what our obedience is leading us towards, it's reminding us of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, is to be reminded that Jesus' substitutionary work on the cross, wherein he was pierced and bled for you, took care of your biggest problem. The reason why we fear exile, the reason why we fear being on the outside in our culture is precisely because our deepest fear that we should realize that we misplace is being separated by God for all eternity because of our sin. That's what our sin deserves. You ought to be exiled without any hope. But Christ on the cross took your sins and he has now sprinkled you with blood to cleanse you. You have been cleansed, chosen, elected by his perfect work, which means you have been spared the greatest exile in this world, which means when you are obeying and it is hurting, you are reminded of Christ's completed work. And what is the real benefit of that? Because following Jesus will be costly. Our symbol is a cross. There's not many religions whose symbol is the guillotine. But the call to Christianity is a call to come and die. It's called to pick up your cross and follow him. It's the cross to lose, or it's the call to lose your life in order to find it. And how is this good news? 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17 says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Every time we are confronted with the weight of our exile, whether that's through a physically fallen world or through spiritually fallen people, we are reminded that Jesus' blood has freed us from a love of things which will not last and cannot satisfy. He has freed us from comfort which quickly crumbles and delight which will ultimately turn out into destruction. And isn't this amazing news? Doesn't this mean that we should actually consider what it is we're encountering and think outside of the mere constraints of is this painful and is this not? Is this hard or is this easy? Following Jesus will be difficult. But when we see the wonderful news of the gospel that he has taken away our sin and each step forward where we feel the world pressing back reminds us of the grace we have in Jesus, that we cannot lose what Christ has given to us. That he has promised us a world where we will worship forever without opposition. And you might say this sounds ridiculous. To think that actually in these moments where it seems everything is going wrong, that we could actually look at it and do some mind jujitsu and convince ourselves that everything's going to be okay. But on the cross, God proves that this really works. You see, it was on the cross that to the casual observer, and even 
the involved observers, like the disciples, that when Jesus, their Messiah, was on the cross, everything had gone wrong in the worst way and irredeemably so. But it was in that moment where Jesus took our exile in our place on the cross where God was actually drawing the nearest to his people. You see, this is the framework Peter wants us to have as we live our lives as elect exiles. If we do not understand that we are exiles because God has loved us, but in the midst of our exiles, God is accomplishing something in us, then we will always feel alone. We will always feel crushed. We will always be frustrated. And we will never realize the goodness of a God who loves us despite what our circumstances say. We experience so many things in this world. But to experience God's love in Jesus Christ comes alongside and says, you have exactly what it takes to make it. At the end of this, he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. I love that idea of multiplication because it implies that something is already there. That for these people who are confused, that for you who feel like whatever is in front of you is the biggest thing you have no control over, he is saying, you already have what you need. And it's the work of the church and the encouragement of brothers and sisters that multiply the wonderful gift that God has already given you. And that's our task together as the church, to remind each other and encourage one another as we together are elect exiles called by God. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you correct our vision, that you help us understand that to be chosen by you through faith in Jesus Christ is often to be rejected by the world in varying degrees. I pray that even as Peter will talk about later, that we are not surprised by this, that these things do not lead us to flee once more to false gods which cannot save, but that we are reminded in those moments that Jesus is near to us, that God has not abandoned us, and that even more than that, he is accomplishing something for our good inside of it. So Lord, I pray for our church in need of a building, for souls in need of comfort, for bodies in need of healing, for weak knees in need of strengthening, that you remind us of the work Jesus has done that promises us that you are always and only for our good as we live out our lives as Christians. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.